I teach Texas Tech in the School of Music. Uh, I teach tuba and euphonium. Uh, I've been doing that for 22 years. Prior to that, I was a doctoral student at the University of Michigan and lived in Omaha, Nebraska for four years before that as a public school teacher. Master's degree from Indiana University. Master's degree from Dana College, which is just north of Omaha. Yep. We were in the same Which conference. doesn't exist anymore, right? Does not exist anymore. Yeah, I remember it though. Yeah, because you went, I to, went Peru. to Peru. You went to Peru, yep. yeah, big rivalry, yep. right? But I grew up in Northern Colorado in Loveland. My driveway to the north gate of Rocky Mountain National Park is about a 45 minute drive. The first thing I saw every morning when I walked out of my room and walked towards our living room was looking out the back windows and seeing Long's Peak and Mount Meeker. Oh uh, man. For, yeah, for the first 18 years of my life, that's what I woke up to. My parents were Minnesotans. And then my dad worked for Kodak, and they'd been in Rochester right before they moved to Colorado. So there's this constant stream of friends and family that would all come to Colorado and stay at our house on their nice. way up to, you know, whatever they were doing in the mountains, but usually Rocky Mountain National Park, Estes Park. I didn't really, like, start embracing photography till much later. So I guess I started thinking more about it in grad school. Uh, got a decent camera for the first time, you know, something where I could control aperture and and right. control shutter speed and things. And, right. and so start thinking about composition in a different way. Yep. We were just doing snapshot photography. And of course we had a Kodak, um, you know, I forget which model that was. It was, it was with the APS, you know, the little cartridges yep. in the analog days. And so I had a series of those and I remember I had one and we had family visiting us in Ann Arbor when I was in, in grad school there. We had the camera with us and we just left it on the back seat of the car and they didn't realize we were poor people, didn't have power locks, so they didn't, they didn't lock the car. And when we came oh, back, no. the camera was gone. Oh, no. And so they're like, okay, well, we're going to buy you a new camera. And so we went to the camera store in Ann Arbor, and they're like, oh, you guys are used to using APS. Well, there was this Nikon that, that they made. They only made one of them. They only made one model, and it was immediately discontinued that used the APS cartridges. But it was a full SLR that used APS. One of my first Grand Canyon trips, this was another just like plain dumb luck. Canyon Village, like right next to the big campground. They have like that little shopping center with the grocery store and everything. And they have actually a really nice photography counter there. But I walk in and there's this basket there and it's APS 100 speed black and white film. And he's like, yeah, we ordered a ton of this and we haven't sold any for like five years. And it was like a dollar a roll. I must have shot 10 rolls. Oh my gosh. In, in black and white. It was dumb luck to be able to just just have that opportunity, but also I'd never shot in black and white before. Yeah, and that changes and everything. It does, because you start seeing light in a, in a completely different way. And immediately, I think I was a better photographer, because it wasn't dealing with color, it was just light. Just light and dark. So it takes and, you down to the very basics, and yeah. yet it's still very complicated. I read once where Ansel Adams said black and white is like the 88 keys on the piano. Yeah. Like that, there's that many shades between yep. white and black. Yep. He said you have to know how to play them all. Yeah, yeah, I think that was like sort of serendipitous. And then by the next time I came back, I had a digital camera. And yeah, I mean, just uh, again, it was a game changer. To take the shot and immediately see, okay, this is what I have. Right. That's kind of how I got back into being outdoors in a very meaningful way and like mm -hmm. very purposeful way. Not just, hey, I'm going to go out for a walk or hey, right. I'm going to go out for a run. I'm going to take these trips with the purpose of being outdoors in a place that's really spectacularly beautiful. I'm going yeah. to try to capture it on film. Not as much of a priority for me anymore. I, In fact, yeah. a, a couple of my most recent trips, I haven't even taken a camera with me. That was another thing I think I always felt with my dad is that he like experienced every vacation we were on through, through his camera. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, just, I didn't want to do that. For me, this is like a really powerful choice when I see something beautiful and choose not to photograph it. Yeah, it is yeah. absolutely a very powerful choice. I've been an outdoors person long before I ever picked up a camera. When I started doing video, I had to be even more deliberate and that does take away a little bit from the experience. So sometimes I'll just turn it on and I'll record it, but I won't say anything. But as far as like the talking parts, I've got to set aside time for it. Otherwise it completely ruins the experience for me. It's not about the photography or the videography, I mean, there's a part of me that started doing it because I want to share it with yeah. people. I'm not willing to ruin my own experience of it just to get a YouTube video or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, you know, we run into this in music all the time. When, when you're in a performance and you start, that moment where you become aware that the performance is being recorded, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that you well, it's like us starting this. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, oh, this, oh yeah, now it's, what? It's yeah, you're like super, yeah, all of a sudden... The, there's a different kind of pressure on you. And and, yeah. and and I think the analogy is beautiful too in that 
if, if I'm in a performance and I'm thinking too much about the recording, that means I'm not thinking about communicating with the audience that's right. right there in front of me. It also reminds me of like, this was kind of a catch word for a while. I don't know if it still is, but the word flow. Yeah. Like if you're thinking about something else yeah. outside of what's happening yeah. when you play or when yeah. you're out in nature, yeah. then it kind of screws up the yeah. flow. Yeah. People can look up flow yeah. state. But yeah, it's totally true. In in backpacking and when you're out in nature, probably when you're skiing. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and when you're playing music, because both yeah. of us are musicians, we've yeah. experienced that. You're so aware of everything and yet like just in it. Yeah. That, that, that's all yeah. I can say is you're just in it. When you really get into that space, yeah. it's really hard to let anything distract. Yeah. And, and I think that's why it's so powerful in performance. And that's why, you know, people have written the books and done the studies because it's it's such a desirable state. And so we, we seek that. I thought that was really cool that, 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 you, that you went right there, that the reason the camera comes out is the, that desire to share. Yeah. It's just a matter of wanting to express what you feel in that mm -hmm. moment. And if yeah. you're in a moment that is, you know, so overwhelmingly beautiful or, you know, even if it's not necessarily beautiful, but just like you wake up and you open your tent flap and you're surrounded by forest and it's just something that you want to be able to express like mm -hmm. I mean I obviously wake up to mostly dirt here yeah. <laughs> in Lubbock so yeah, yeah. you know it's just this desire to express what it means to you and how it makes you feel when you're in the moment yeah and, and that it also it's <laughs> the impossibility of it yeah and, and yet there, there's that desire to want to try like you said there are those moments that you can't capture in film video text music painting that as much as we want to bring someone to that space yeah. you can't you can't you you can't fully express yeah. what it was like part of the reason why we create is yeah. because you can't articulate something yeah. you want to use more creative ways to do that, but yeah. it's still impossible. That's been my frustration with video, especially. Yeah. It's a new tool of mm -hmm. expression, and so I'm learning that, but also it's just like, no, this doesn't quite do it. Like, how can I make it express what I'm feeling more accurately? And it's just, that's part of the fun, right. trying to figure out how, but also, you know, I think what keeps us going back and, and mm -hmm. learning more and, and to keep trying to do it because it's, it's almost unattainable yeah well in, in in the situation that you described that unzip in the tent moment you know and i mean like right now we don't even have to close our eyes we can hear that oh yeah we i'm can there hear that we can feel that right and and because we've been there and anyone else who's been there they can watch a video and yeah. and can be there with you but someone who hasn't felt that and heard that and doesn't know that feeling of yeah. waking up in a cold tent and everything's kind of stiff be, not wanting to move <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you know yeah, you're, you're in your to. warm spot yes <laughs> yeah and, and as soon as you move you're going to touch something cold yes yes when you finally get enough like courage to get the arm out and you reach for the tent zipper yeah. And it's stiff and yeah. it's stuck, but there's that the feeling of the cold air. There's yep. it's the, very visceral, like yeah. just just even thinking about it. Yeah, that moment is is you know it's one of the reasons I think those of us who backpack do it mm -hmm. is is for that moment. The Southwest too, for me, it was it was it was this place I wasn't familiar with. The downside when you grow up that close to a national park is you generally don't go to other national parks. So I'd never been to Grand Canyon, I'd never been to Zion, never been to Bryce. You know, obviously I knew of them and knew what they were, but had no real concept in my head of of what being there would be like. But I remember the first time I was in Zion, it was two thousand three. One of the first guest resettles I've been invited to do is at Southern Utah University. I had a former student from here who was a band director there that invited me to come in and do a resettle and master class. And so we went out there over spring break, went to Vegas for a couple of days, went to LA, and then we're driving back through Utah and did the recital and everything. And we were hanging out after the recital and he said, hey, are you guys going to drive through Zion tomorrow on your way back to Flagstaff? And we're like, I don't know, we haven't thought about it. He goes like, do it. She said, it's low season. You can drive all the way up the canyon still before you have to take the bus. You know, we looked at the weather and it was going to be a spectacular day, you know, kind of cool, but sunny. So we're like, yeah, we'll do it. We drove in and both just immediately fell in love with the place. At the time, I was about 50 pounds heavier than I am now and not in shape at all. And again, you know, I, mean, I was someone, I went hiking, backpacking, skiing, ran track, rode my bike all up and down the front range as a kid. It was always mm -hmm. in shape. 
So we, we pulled off at one of the roadside pullouts in Zion Canyon. I think it was uh, Patriarchs. There's a little like overview and it's like a quarter mile paved trail that maybe has a hundred feet of elevation gain. And by the time we got to the overlook, I was sucking air. <laughs> my knees hurt, my hips hurt. And I'm like, okay, this stops now. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's when I started running again and drop the weight. Being there was the trigger of there's this whole part of my life that I'm realizing right now, just looking at this that I'm missing, mm -hmm. but also realizing like, if I don't get in shape, I'm not going to be able to experience this in the way that I used to. Right. And so that was in March. And then I went back in August and did observation point angels landing. Wow. And was uh, 50 pounds lighter. That was a huge turning point for me. And, and that's when I started thinking more about getting back into hiking. And then that's when I started thinking about, man, I wonder if I could get back into backpacking. Were you skiing all this time? I was not skiing you... all this time. So, I, cause I, I stopped skiing when I was in grad school, probably cause of money, probably cause I was right. so far from Colorado all the time. And then, you know, when Susan and I got married, she had no interest. We didn't have money. So I didn't ski from, I guess the last time I went was, March of 95 over spring break. Okay. Uh, my second year in my master's. And then you didn't start back until you moved here until after a Until while. until Banff. Okay. In 2015. So wow. I, went, I went 20 years without skiing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> skiing is great to get into as a midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's awesome as a midlife crisis. And almost as expensive as a new yeah, sports yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, <laughs> at, this, at this point, we're kind of like, yeah, I think the Corvette would have been cheaper. Maybe the Corvette and the Harley would have been cheaper. But, but yeah, it, it's... It's a whole different experience as an adult with money. Yeah. You know, where you can be like, okay, yeah, I'm going to buy that gear. And, I still don't know, you know what that is. Yes. <laughs> but, but good it's for like, you. Okay. Good for you. you know, Maybe you, someday I'll find out. You, you, you know, I would actually like to snowboard because yeah. as a kid growing up, I was a skateboarder yeah. and I feel like it would be a pretty easy transition, but I don't like, I think of having the skis on yeah. and I immediately fall down in, right, my, in right. my mind. I just don't know how <laughs> it's, like, it, they're, they're opposite learning curves. Um, so skiing, you can go from never having been on skis to getting around pretty well in a couple of days. Really? And then you hit an absolute plateau. Once you hit intermediate level, especially, unless you're really working at it, getting lessons, skiing a lot, you're going to have yeah. a hard time getting from like that intermediate to advanced and then especially to the expert level. Interesting. With snowboarding, you're going to suck for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're just... Well, you're, you can't move your feet no. separately, no. individually. That yeah. would... And you have I no pulse. I think that would be a little bit difficult. And, but... and you have no pulse. As a beginner, you're kind of forced to be moving sideways a lot of the time. Right. But that makes it really easy to dig an edge. And then, you know, tomahawk. And so... And it... you can't do anything about it. No. So... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You can't step out to stop yourself. You got no poles. You're just, you're going down. My, my friends who I know who snowboard, that's what they've said. They said, you know, it took them a long time before they felt like they were even competent. Like but they're just falling down all the that. time, but this is once you get the feel for it, once you really learn how to, how to shift your weight and how to carve a turn yeah. and how to skid a turn, because I mean, snowboarders are so good at using every shape of turn. And that's what, you know, skiers have learned that from them. When I was in high school, we skied on long skinny skis that were carvers. You know, your goal was to kind of carve every turn and we do a little bit of sliding around and skidding, but it was, you know, you, you can't really be in control. With, with the new shape skis, and they're so much fatter, they're sort of designed to have a technique, depending on what, what you're doing specifically, but the technique is more snowboard technique. So especially people who are on like the really fat skis that are fully rockered, the tail has mm -hmm. a rocker in addition to the tip. So that means the tails won't catch. So you can, you, can, okay. you can flip your skis around any direction you want. And so a lot of people are using a technique that's a lot more like snowboard technique. When you see people in steeps and see them in the bumps and in the trees and stuff, there's a lot of time they're moving and their body's facing downhill, but their skis are fully sideways. And that's one of the techniques that I've kind of had to learn that I didn't pick up back in the 80s. So here's another thing, like if I'm there, yeah, yeah, I'll take a lesson. There's no teenage male ego there anymore either. You know, I don't worry about getting injured now because I don't have that. Hey, everybody watch this. I'm more there for like just the experience. And, and yeah. I like I like the puzzle of it, you know, especially being in really steep, really gnarly terrain and thinking, OK, how how am I going to get down this? And, and not so much like how fast am I going to get down this or how cool am I going to look 
when yeah. I'm getting down this. It's like, how am I going to get down this and be in control the whole way? Right. And there's a lot of problem solving involved in yeah. that. And I think like in backpacking too, but in skiing, yeah. I imagine the, the problem solving is occurring at a faster rate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Just... Depending, depending on what you do it, and, and and yeah, getting the confidence to just be able to to go and like tree skiing takes so long to get comfortable with. To have enough confidence in your ability to steer those skis and right. to control your speed, and with you know obstacles all around. So much of flow state, so much of confidence, so much of the ability to navigate those difficult situations goes back to really basic fundamentals. When when I'm in a ski lesson. I'm always thinking, man, my students would love to see this right now. Because with my students, you know, they want to work on really difficult music and they want to work on doing all the acrobatic stuff and playing loud and all the stuff that's fun and really impressive. And we start out with long tones and mm -hmm. we start out with scales. And when I'm in a ski lesson, you know, I am, I can ski most of the mountain at Taos. But when I have a lesson there, quite often we start out on the beginner run and they're making me ski really, really slow and do slow carved turns. So yeah. not relying on the speed and the G-forces and the edge is really biting, getting the skis up on an angle, but actually really working in slow motion on the weight shift and on keeping the entire edge of the ski all the way through the turn. Yeah. And to the point where if you're doing that early in the morning after it's been groomed and you can see individual tracks. And so we'll do a turn that takes me all the way across the beginner run, pop the skis off, walk back over, and ski instructors go on there and pointing along different points of the turn. Say, here's, wow. where, you, here's where you shifted your weight. You see how, the, see how the tail started to skid. And, I, and again, I'm sitting there thinking, man, my, my, yeah. my, 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 stu my music students would love to see me having to do this. Right. They'd be like, yeah, how's that feel? <laughs> <laughs> You know? <laughs> well, right? it feels pretty good, actually. Because yeah, yeah. if you can't do it slow, you're not going to be right. able to do yeah. it fast. And, and, and having that basic understanding of when you do this with your body, this is the result with whatever the instrument is, whether it's a musical instrument, right. whether it's the skis. And also, you got to think about your foot with something six feet long attached to it. Think about the radius of that. And so if your foot moves this far, <laughs> what happens to the tip of that ski? It's magnified by that much. And, and so tiny little movements in your feet, from the ankle, from the hip, just with a little bit of a weight shift. I mean, you can really send the skis in a lot of different directions, and especially because, you know, yeah, they're in independent yeah. of each other too. Yeah. Two of my favorite instructors at Taos are both musicians. And so when, it, when we're in lessons on the lift, we're talking a lot about that. Like, you know, this is what it's like to, to learn this. And this is what it's like to, to learn this part of skiing and how it's very much like doing this in music. And we talk a lot about rhythm and the importance of it because nice. that's another thing that'll get you in that state where you're not over-focusing. So one, one of my uh, teachers there, sometimes he does actually carry a metronome with him. But, but he said, that's so, cool. yeah, because he said a lot of people need that. They don't have the confidence to make turns when they need to turn. And so they're on flat terrain and they're just kind of used to turning wherever they want. And then they get into trickier terrain or moguls or trees. And all of a sudden you're forced to make turns and they don't have the confidence that like, yeah, I can make a turn wherever I want. But if you can turn in rhythm, exactly in rhythm, and he does it with his poles with yeah. me usually. So he'll stand up behind me and just be like... He wants a turn on every one of those. We do it on flat terrain first. Then I have to do it in mixed terrain. So whether that's a good place to turn or not, I have to make the turn. Nice. So learning how to do that, like as you go over the top of a bump, yeah, that's not somewhere where normally I would want to make the turn. Right. But then you also start realizing, wait, no, that's actually pretty good. Like you want to stay out of the trough. It's the same thing with, with, with music students, right? You really have control when you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. Yep. And that's what playing in time really shows. Yeah. It's not that, okay, I can sort of figure out how to make that sound generally, but can you do it at this time? And right. exactly with everybody else, that's that's the kind of control you have to have as a musician. And I think all of it plays in for me. I mean, a lot of what I do as a musician is also tied to my training as a runner. In the planning and the structuring, it's so similar to that, that, you know, if, if you're going to run 26.2 miles, it's the same thing when people think, okay, yeah, I'd, I'd love to play like a concerto, you know, really big piece like that, something really difficult, or I'd love to play a big recital with a lot of hard rap, yeah. or I want to take this audition. The mistake that a lot of musicians make is that they don't understand, especially young musicians don't understand the importance of structure. For me, the structure replaces the discipline. The the, the discipline is sitting down and putting the structure in place. Right. Yeah. And, and, I, and I also know for some people that's like, that's kind of what turns them off of it. And I, and I have to be really careful about that in my teaching in music too, that if some of the students, if things get too structured, like you miss a day mm -hmm. and now it's like, well, it's over. Right. Right. Cause I missed a day. And, 
And I think you, you have to be able to have that understanding of like, no, st structure is, is just that. It's just a model. Yeah. It well, and structure mean also ready. includes breaks. Yeah. You, you got to know to. when to take yeah. a break. Yeah. Because, yeah. When you, when you look at my training plans, I mean, like, you know, I, I ran 15 miles this morning. I ran 20 last week. Well, why is that? I mean, I'm, I'm a week closer to the marathon. Shouldn't I be running further? Well, no, because this week I had to dial it back. Yeah. And also this week I ran hills. I was out in the, the canyons on the east end of town um, where last week it was 20 miles totally flat. It's the mixing up of what you're doing so that you don't burn out mentally, emotionally, or get physically. physically injured. Yeah. 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 And, and especially for road runners, that's, that's huge because we're running the same stride length on the same surface <clears throat> mile after mile after mile. You know, whereas yep. trail runners, it's more repetitive. Yep, trail runners are going up and down hills. Yeah, they're they're change. They're ha they have to change step size. Yeah, and sometimes they have to change step direction. You know, mm -hmm. you're stepping out this way to push off this way. Yeah, and a road runner never does that. I feel like the reason why I got plantar fasciitis was because it's just repetitive, and yep. you can get lazy when when yep. it's repetitive. <laughs> You yep. can get to where you're not really thinking about proper form and yep. not thinking about your stride. Yeah. And yeah. You know, and, and it, <laughs> this would also, also people just sort of shake their head at me when, when I say this. They're like, okay, so what do you listen to when you run? And I'm like, you know, the world. The world. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's, there's, the birds. Yeah, there's no earbuds. Um, <laughs> I, I've just never done that. I, I've tried it a couple times, but it's, it's just not me. It does help raise your awareness of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember seeing an interview with uh, Natalie Coughlin, who was an Olympic swimmer. She talked about how she, you know, when they, when they first came out with the waterproof headphones, mm -hmm. she was like, this is the best thing ever for a serious swimmer. Because all those, like, boring laps up and yeah. down the pool. And so she started training with the, with the earbuds in and, like, listening to music. And her results kind of dropped. She took the earbuds out and started like really trying to be in this place where she was focusing on something. Mm -hmm. So for this lap, I'm going to focus on this part of my stroke. Mm -hmm. For this lap, I'm going to focus on this. And yeah, she said everything came back and she got yeah. that much stronger. I think there is that time to be sort of mindless, but I think for training, especially for someone who's training at that level where you're trying to be competitive, giving yourself that sort of space to be really, really mindful about what you're doing and why you're there yeah. is you know, that sense of purpose. And wearing really earphones is a, is a distraction. Yeah. It takes away yeah. from that. I can say that when I ran with music, I would inevitably try to run to the rhythm of the yep. music <laughs> instead of running at a pace uh -huh. that was, yep. you know, what I could mm -hmm. and, and should be running at. My favorite was running at sunrise and watching uh, the sun yeah. come up. And yeah, yeah, yeah that was one of my uh, series that I had when I was on Facebook. I had the benefits of running at sunrise series. Yeah, yeah I do it wherever I go. So, you know, I, I, had, I had some great shots from Austin one morning when I was down running around oh, uh, I bet. the lake mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the trails down there. I've got some really good ones from, you know, up in Colorado. I've got some great ones from here. In the winter months, there are always herons living in uh, Higginbotham Park. And I've got a couple of shots, like, silhouetted with the sunrise behind them. And the oh, lake. very and cool. It's one of those th that you look like. People are like, wow, where did you take that? I was like, you know, about a mile over there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? but that, so that brings me to uh, my next point, it, which yeah. is, like, to... To experience that stuff, you have to be there. You got to be there. You just have yeah. to make the choice to go and, yeah. and be there. And it's yeah. like, that's one of the reasons why I love backpacking so much yeah. is because you're on foot. And if you're out there for a few days, like you literally witness and experience all of this, yes. you know, from sunrise to, to sundown, yeah. you're experiencing everything and yeah there are some stretches where nothing happens mostly though there's something that is just really special and you don't see it unless you go yeah yeah you, yeah you got to get out there it, you know all the different things that i do and, and obviously they're very different you know i'm a resort skier i, I don't backcountry ski because i ski by myself i mean i have a shovel and a probe but if yeah. you're by yourself it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah it doesn't help and <laughs> even when you go to a place like say you go to jackson hole not everybody is going to hop on the tram and, and go up to the top of the bull you don't have to ski down you know that's expert only terrain up there and a lot of times the weather is horrible can't see your hand in front of your face and you're like okay i'm gonna go into something that's got a 38 degree slope yeah without being able to see and it's like well yeah that's that's what you do if you're going to ski up there but you can always ride the tram back down but i think a lot of people just don't go up there and and don't realize what they're missing by not being in that place and, and i'm sure you know backcountry skiers look at resort skiers sort of the way that i think as backpackers we look at the like the people in cars driving through a national <laughs> 
apart. Yeah. They're like stuck in traffic yeah. and they're, they're all going to the same viewpoint and then having to like wait in line to take a photo. Yeah. And, and once you're in the back country, even half a mile in most national parks, all of a sudden you're just not seeing people anymore. You're seeing stuff that people just never have access to in the right. car. And so, yeah, I think backcountry skiers look at resort skiers that way. Like, like yeah. you guys don't realize how much you're missing with, 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 with sticking with that experience. But no, I, I think with backpacking, with hiking, in my running even, there, there are things that I see that I either wouldn't normally see or maybe wouldn't normally, normally notice. No. I think too there's a disconnect with with most people because you know a long time ago like we yeah. were bipeds until you know we decided not to be and yeah. and now <laughs> you know it's yeah. those of us who choose to be bipeds again right. you're reconnecting to the earth it's just like you're going back to what we should be doing mm -hmm. really I, I think sometimes having to tell yourself like this is something my body was designed to do you know or as a, at least as long as there have been humans they've been able to adapt their bodies to do this right. i think that's a huge factor in marathoning is because you've you've done marathon i've done one marathon yeah. right but and it, i don't know you are I a really, marathoner yeah, no, I, no. I don't I don't know no. if I would count it as a marathon because okay. it was Baton Memorial no, Death March, which was is it 20, full of sand. Was it 26.2 miles? Yes, it was. It was a marathon. Okay, so, <laughs> so here's the rule. Okay, start line, finish line. If you cross this one and this one, you are a marathoner. Okay. And, and that is what I my, did not run the whole thing. <laughs> it doesn't for matter. Sure, though. It doesn't matter. <laughs> this, this is one of the things that's so cool about, about the marathon community is nobody cares how slow you are or how fast you are. Yeah. If you cross those two lines, you're a marathoner. Yeah. Because what that also means, it's not just crossing those two lines. It's everything that leads up to that. Yeah. Like that one for me was not about necessarily doing a marathon because of what it was and yeah. it was baton and I, I actually did that when I ETS'd from the army yeah. so it was like a very that. symbolic thing yeah. so it wasn't necessarily about the marathon no. aspect of it but it you was trained just, yeah but oh for sure yeah, yeah, yeah. you trained yeah. you know which is why I, this is something that surprised me when I ran my first one and you know you're at the start line kind of talking to people and that's always one of the first questions hey is this your first marathon and I said yeah and people were congratulating me I thought it was so strange that they were congratulating congratulating me at the start line and and so I finally, you chose to do it right because I and I finally asked one of me he's like he's like you got here because he said he yeah. said you've trained you're here you know have a great race yeah. you know and, and there's there's something super cool too about being at the start line with all yeah. of those people yeah it's just at, at sunrise I mean usually yeah. they're at sunrise yeah. and yeah. it's like with the baton back when I did it there were six or seven survivors oh uh, wow at the finish line in running alone and backpacking yeah. and just all yeah. of that there's definitely a community there that's very supportive just because yeah. you chose to do it yeah and it's hard yeah i mean i've read all about it but this is gonna be my first through hiking experience well it's not exactly a through yeah. hike but it's i mean it'll be a little over 100 miles if we right. finish it'll be right. a little that's over 100 way longer than anything so, I've, I've ever done you know i think the most i've been out probably is like five nights and that was like way back in boy so scout we days we'll be back we'll be out for like 10 or 11 yeah i think yeah so and yeah and just because nobody knows kevin's finishing the colorado yeah. trail with me this season and the dogs and the dogs of course <laughs> yeah but you know i always hear about that community about the through hiking community and i think it's the same thing that you don't get brushed off because you're not as prepared it's like kind of like this microcosm of society that it's exactly how society should be yeah but it's like you know i've had people near hypothermic this is one reason why i always backpack with a stove i was able to light up my stove and he held his hands over it and then another guy that didn't have a first aid kit and had some blisters and so you know we helped him out especially along those long trails I feel like the people who live and go out in those areas like that's just part of life for them they regularly go out and help the through hikers that need it yeah. and like trail magic is a thing yeah. people go and, and will set up and have like burgers you know because oh, through hikers don't <laughs> we eat peanut butter <laughs> yeah and trail mix for 500 miles you yeah know? so it's a really cool community you know and that's another another tie-in to the marathon community and i think it's because of like the level of experience going out for a night of backpacking is not the same as through hiking running a 5k is not the same as a marathon right and and the intensity of the experience is part of what pulls people together yes that you respect and you understand someone who's willing to put themselves through that yes you know that the, okay we have something in common 
the the second time I ran Salt Lake City Marathon, I was about mile 19, was on just under 345 pace. I was going to finish three hours, 45 minutes, wow. which for me was going to be a PR. But that's also, at the time, was marath- was Boston qualifying time for right. women. From about 25 to 35, it's mm-hmm. right around there, at least it was then. And, and so there were a lot of extremely fit women running around me that we were all running around the same pace. I chatted with a couple of them. And I was running up a hill. And I was mostly by myself, but there was a pack behind me. And I I looked up the hill and I could see there was a woman up there that was really struggling. Like the knees were starting to buckle. You could tell she'd been sick. And as I got maybe 15 feet from her, down she went. Oh my gosh. Just collapsed. And uh, that had happened to me here on a race here. Somebody collapsed in front of me, had a heart attack, didn't make it. So I'd seen it happen before and it just, so it scared the heck out of me. I mean, she, yeah. was, she was much younger. And so I picked up my pace a little bit and it was close to an intersection and there were two police manning the intersection. So one of them started going towards her. Five women went sprinting past me. I mean, full on sprint and got to her before I did or the cop did. All these people are people who are probably trying to qualify for Boston and were on pace to do it. And gave it it up. Gave it up to to help help somebody. Yeah. It brings people together, the fact that everybody's willing to go through that. And that's the experience I had in the military, too. And it's interesting to me because a lot of times I talk to veterans, and the number one thing they say about how difficult it is to reintegrate in society is that they can't find that anywhere. And, I mean, that's one reason why... You know, I just feel like being out in nature and doing stuff like this is so crucial to like mental health and just in finding community. There's more and more talk of this now too. Uh, You know, I listen to Off the Couch. I read Outside Magazine. And, you know, I don't think most of us were aware. I don't know how we couldn't have been, but we weren't aware for years that like this was what we call being outside and, you know, the outdoor adventure It was a white, upper-middle-class thing, Uh, largely male, and pretty much like 20 to 40 was was sort of the core age group. And yeah, I think there's efforts to try to grow all sorts of different communities within that community. And it's within. It's not like we're going to have all these separate communities of people who are mountain bikers or runners or backpackers or whatever, but it's it's, let's be more inclusive, but, but trying to be much more aware of the fact that like, hey... This is something that anybody can do. And, right. uh, you know, I've been in this all my life. And so it's really hard to convince people that they can do it. They think it's like, okay, you have to have been born there. Well, of course you do that. You were born in Colorado. And I was like, well, yeah, but I haven't lived there for 30 years. Well, you know, you, you just had the opportunity to grow up. I mean, yes, I had awesome opportunities. We had outdoor education in junior high where they took us on backpacking trips. <sighs> as part, oh of, part of our school. You know, oh everybody got out of school for three days to go backpacking. That's crazy. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, you know. Or you could go rock climbing too. I I, I went backpacking and wow. rock climbing. You know, my first time skiing was them taking us out of school for a day and taking us to the local ski area, which was still open in Rocky Mountain National Park then. And we got the bus ride and our lift ticket and a lesson and rentals and lunch for free. I feel like there's a definition of outdoorsy yeah. that it's inaccurate. I agree. Outside Magazine wrote this article. It was written by a woman. I don't remember her name, but it doesn't really matter. The title of it was uh, something to the effect of why outdoorsy types suck at money. Mm. And I was like, this is me. I should read this. And so I started reading it. In the first paragraph, she talks about how she squandered away $200,000. I was like, this is not me. (laughs) This does not have anything to do with me. But I I finished the article and it was so clear that outdoorsy to this author meant very prescribed outdoor activity. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've always considered myself outdoorsy. I grew up outside and I realized after reading it, we really need to like stop trying to restrict it as far as like who yeah. that is referring to because never in my life have I ever even had the opportunity to squander away 200 <laughs> grand. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but um, I'd love to have the opportunity to. With Outside Magazine and a lot of the press. It's very, it's, it's coming from a very privileged yeah, perspective. It's privileged perspective and it's also like if it's below this level of adventure, yeah. it's, oh, not, yeah. it's not really an activity. 
Right. Right. Like if you're not doing a first descent or a first descent or a fastest known time or. Right. Um, and I think in her article, she did talk about skiing. So it does take some money to, to be a skier. Yeah. But just because you're not a skier doesn't mean you're not no. outdoorsy. Exactly. Like that's not yeah. the only thing no. to do yeah. in the outdoors. No. And, and not even the only thing to do in the outdoors in the winter. You know, I mean, you can, you can rent a pair of snowshoes for 10 bucks and go to a place with free parking and no trail pass and snowshoe. Yeah. Or you uh, can have fun with post holing. Right. <laughs> I mean, can't, wait, 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 can't wait, 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 afford no, $10 no. You, rental you can, fee? You can never Just go have fun with post for an hour. <laughs> Nobody has fun post holing tip. <laughs> if you do, this is true. you, you got a problem. No, but, but, but I think the obstacles aren't as big as we try to make them. And, and I, I agree. I think the press, I think that the outdoor press has a lot to do with that. The people who need that are the athletes who are trying to make a living who, hey, good for them. Yeah. You know, people who enjoy this to the level and have trained to the level where they're finding through sponsors, through competition, they're finding a way to make a living, but they're not going to be able to do that if they don't have the podcasts and Outside Magazine and Ski right. Magazine and Runner's World. Right. They have to have that press so that their name gets out there so that they can get their sponsors and their sponsors yeah. can stay happy. And so I think you have that whole sort of industry there that celebrates itself and inspires the rest of us. I do get inspired by by people who do things on that level. But I think that you and I understand what those people are and what they do and right. we respect it. Yep. But we also understand that's not trail running. Right. And that's not running. That's not backpacking. You don't have to go out and do the PCT to be a backpacker. Yeah. Even within the backpacking community, yeah. there are those that are trying yeah. to get the yeah. fastest known time and they fly by. They you yeah. know, barely have a pack and... Yeah. Uh, ultra light to almost to a dangerous level. And, yeah. You know, you can get really into yeah. expenses even in yeah. backpacking. I mean, as I've found out <laughs> trying to lighten my pack, yeah. you know, as I'm uh, getting older, yep. paying $600, $700 for a tent, yep. you can get really expensive gear if there's a reason for it. Yep. Like I said, asthmatic and aging, it's a necessity for me yeah. to be able to keep doing it now. Well, and also trying to crush 120 but, miles in 10 days. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But... And with two dogs. <laughs> yeah, with two dogs. And photography It's gear. like, yeah. yes. The point is that there you don't have to do all of that. No, you don't. If there's a medical necessity for lightening your pack, you can work up yeah. to it like I did over yeah. years. But you don't have to do that. There's yeah. always an entry-level way yep. to go outside and, and just be doing it. Be out yep. there. I mean, I grew up just walking around the forest. It cost nothing. Yeah. Other yeah. than I was privileged to have it in my backyard. You know, not everybody mm -hmm. has that. Well, and when I was a kid, even in Colorado then, we had a sporting goods store in Loveland that sold, it was mostly ski gear. They had some hiking and backpacking gear, but not a lot. So most of us got our backpacking gear at the surplus store. Which was right? super heavy. <laughs> super heavy. Old army oh surplus. God. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it wasn't all surplus. I mean, they did carry like newer packs and stuff, but this was yeah. external frame. Like weight yeah. was not a thing. Really durable stuff, yeah. but, but heavy yeah. stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, like my first backpack trip was Deserted Village on the North Fork Trail in uh, Dunraven Gulch. So right above Glen Haven between Loveland and Fort Collins. And if you go far enough up that trail, you do cross into Rocky Mountain National Park. But Deserted Village is just to the east of the National Park boundary on, on the North Fork Trail. And it's so it's like 2.7 miles or something like that. Oh, okay. Which, you know, for 12-year-old me, trip, yeah, for 12 year old yeah. me, that was great. And you felt like you'd done something because you'd carried yeah. all your stuff to that place yep. and you set up your tent. It's and, empowering. And yeah. it and it inspires you to do the next Right, exactly. Next because thing. yeah, that's the thing. Is in, and then you talk to those people who are like going up Stormy Peak. And so they've got 10 miles to go before they get to their campsite. And you're like, whoa, I wonder if I could do that. Yeah. And then it's like, well, yeah, I did this two and a half and this wasn't so bad. And I stayed out and you know what? It's even better if the first time you go out, you get rained on. Yeah. Because now you know that's not something to yep. be afraid of. When you read your backpacking book and stuff, and there's all this emphasis, you got to stay dry. You got to stay dry. You got to yeah. stay dry. Especially so, when it's cold. Yeah. And so yeah. you think, oh my gosh, if it rains, I'm going to die. <laughs> right? And, and and so so that first time that you're out there, which luckily for me was my first trip. I mean, yes, we got rained on in the night when we're all safely in our tents and a couple people's tents leaked because they bought them at Kmart. Yeah, ask and, Natasha <laughs> about that. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a tent I sold her. <laughs> I can't. Natasha was yelling at me through the rain. She says, is it normal for there to be a stream of water running down your tent floor? And I said, 
Nope. But what was funny, again, talking about yeah. like how everybody just rushes to help, like we were out with four other women yeah. and to myself and another of the women, both like Natasha didn't even have to get out of her tent. We were like, yeah. hey, get your tarp ready. Let's go. Yeah. And so we both like ran out, threw the tarp over <laughs> Natasha's tent and then ran back in our tents. Yeah. We're like, how's that? Is it still leaking? <laughs> I think it fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and this yeah. is all happening at like two in the morning. Right, <laughs> right. Like, yeah. <laughs> Cause, yeah, because that's what it does. Yeah, but you know, I, we, we got rained on the night. We got rained on on the trail. And you know, I mean, back then, again, it wasn't that everybody who went on that trip had a Gore-Tex parka. First of all, I don't think Gore-Tex existed yet. And if it did, it was like military only. So I mean, we had plastic ponchos that you bought at Kmart for three bucks. And it was cool because it covered your pack too. Because yeah. the idea of a pack rain cover was like not, yeah. a, not a thing in the 70s. You know, even for me where my family hadn't done any of that. As Colorado was really growing, I think that's part of the reason that they were so interested in outdoor education was they realized most of us weren't growing up in families that were native Coloradans. You know, people had moved from industrial cities, you know, like my family had from, from Rochester, New York, to like this new kind of little silicone in Northern Colorado with, where HP had a plant in right, every town right. in Northern Colorado. And Kodak was in Windsor and IBM was in Boulder. And so all these people had transplanted there and maybe didn't have a background at all in anything outdoorsy. That certainly was my family. So if I hadn't gotten introduced to backpacking through the Boy Scouts and through school, I probably wouldn't have gotten into it. Yeah. They lowered that entry point for us. They did the hard stuff. They planned the yeah. trip. They conceived of the trip. Because if, if you've never been, it's really hard to just sit down and think, you know what, I'm going to go and carry all my stuff on my back and yeah. sleep outside for a couple <laughs> nights. I mean, that, There are some logistics of Yeah, you, you, you don't just like, <laughs> sit there and dream up that you need somebody to come to you and say hey hey let's let's do this let's go outside I've done this before I think you'll really enjoy it you sort of have to have that to get people to get out there and then once they're out there I think some people realize that first trip and maybe someone's because they just have horribly traumatic experiences or <laughs> Poor planning. Somebody's like, yeah. oh, yeah, it's your first trip. Okay, well, we're doing 12 miles today, and yeah. we got about 3,800 right. feet of elevation gain and loss. And yep. yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, you're in shape. This is another place where, where the marathoning really helps. That point where you start to have the kind of pain that is telling you to stop whatever you're doing right now. That's yeah. what your body is telling you. And learning that you can run through that kind of pain yeah. and not and die. And be okay. Backpackers have to have that too. And no matter how well you plan that trip, maybe there's the coming storm. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you know what? I know everybody's tired, but we have to get over this pass before that right. storm hits. And so we've got another 1,200 feet of climbing to go. And yeah. no more breaks. Everybody get a good drink of water. Everybody eat a bar. And... Let's yeah. go. I wanted to talk to you about, again, for me, Natasha was yeah. the very first musician friend to express any interest in going yeah. out. And I'm just curious what your thoughts about musicians and why so few tend to be <laughs> interested? I, I think there's fear of injury. Yes. I think that's huge. When, when I tell people I ski, they're like, aren't you worried about your hands? I haven't had many injuries. I've had one concussion, broke my tailbone, landed way too hard off of a jump, and basically mm. sat down on the binding. Ooh. And the skis didn't pop off. So I could have blown my knees out too, but I was in pretty good shape at the time. So my knees were okay. But my knee hit me right here. Missed my lips by you know, a couple inches yeah. and hard. Like I had a really nasty bruise here for about you four months. You would have months. busted your lips for sure. I would have busted my lips and probably knocked out teeth. Yikes. If it had hit me this, you know, here. And at the time I was right at the end of undergrad when I was starting to take my playing much more seriously and was thinking right. about it as a career. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that was scary. And I guess that's always there. I mean, yeah, I know I've had a couple of hard falls where, you know, I, I get up and I'm kind of shaking the hand a little bit and thinking, oh, no, yeah. I think it's okay. Last time I was skiing at Jackson Hole, got on the lift. I'm just chatting with this really nice lady. We realized we're both musicians. And then she said, so what do you do? And I said, I teach at Texas Tech. And she said, do you come to Santa Fe? And I said, yeah. I said, actually, I played in the opera orchestra last summer. And she goes, that's where I've seen you before. And she was principal clarinet in Atlanta Symphony, also principal clarinet in the Teton Festival Music oh, Orchestra. Wow. And then also she plays in Santa Fe in the Chamber Music Festival, and that's where we had seen each other. We ended up skiing about a half a day together. And we talked a lot about this. I said, I said do, do people always ask you, do you worry about your hands? She said, yeah. And she said she actually wore splints 
under her gloves for a while because she was like, you know, you just in case you have that fall. I mean, the, the most yeah. common ski injury actually is a broken thumb. You're holding onto a ski pole and then you try to catch yourself. She goes, I guess if that happens, that happens. I think there's a level of musician who gets really into it. And part of it is because look at where the music festivals are. Grand yeah. Teton, Aspen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, Santa Barbara for a summer for me. You have to get to sort of that elite level before you're playing in those festivals. But so yeah. many of my friends who are musicians who are really outdoorsy, a lot of them had even started there. Like I talked to them, they're like, oh yeah, you know, I spent a summer in Aspen and I just couldn't not do that. Well, and you, know, you and I have both been to Banff. Even the people who are doing like seven day, 10 day residencies, they get out and do something. You know, they'll climb Tunnel Mountain. Shoot, even just hiking the little trail down into town. For people who've had those experiences, it's easier. But also with musicians, there's that paranoia of, if I'm not practicing, somebody else is. Even my friends in Banff, i would be like, hey, I'm going skiing on Saturday. Who wants to go with me? Oh gosh, I, I can't go skiing. I'm here to practice. And it's like, I'm here to practice too. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, but we're also here, if you look at Banff's, mission statement and you look at the website and why it exists it's it's that mix yeah it, they, they purposely put it in that place they could have put that out in the middle of the plains out near saskatoon or something yep. <laughs> you know? so let's go there how do you think that the being outside and that kind of landscape it doesn't have to be as yeah. beautiful as Banff. but what do you think the connection is how can that help musicians i i think <laughs> Classical musicians especially are incredibly tightly wound. We were just talking about this the other night after my recital. The difference in approach to music between dancers and classical musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, it's execution, execution, execution. And to the dancers, it was like, that's a cool gesture. Yeah. You know, this is what I hear. Let's turn that into sound. It's and more intuitive. Yeah. And they're, and they're looking for descriptive words to describe the music they hear. And I think the classical music world is so much about executing everything that's on that page. Yeah. And also that it's so competition based. You know, you have to win an audition to, to be able to make a living at it. You and I have both heard this. How many hours does a serious musician practice every day? You know, I mean, I remember hearing like five hours. Yeah. Like, like if, if you're not practicing five hours a day, you're not a serious musician. I always heard eight hours. It's like, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it says who? I mean, there was a time in my life I practiced about eight hours a day. Me too. But it wasn't because I was trying to practice eight hours a day. It was because of what I was trying to get done and what I was preparing for required that level of practice. Right. We teach musicians to hate themselves for every moment that they don't have the instrument in their hands. And I think that's a huge factor. I think we have to get them out of that mindset. I'm a better musician because I run. Would an extra couple hours of sleep every night probably help me be even better yeah but if i have to choose between the extra sleep and the running i'm gonna i'm gonna take the run 100 percent of the time yeah because you know what it does for me i'm also an asthmatic what it does for me just on the cardiovascular side is so valuable what it does for me mentally what it does for me in terms of setting and achieving goals i feel like most of our creativity comes from like it grows from our experiences how yeah. how can we express certain emotions if we right. haven't experienced it. Yeah, yeah. This is this and, is another piece about eight hours in a practice room. Because right. that's all I know in life, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what the hell? That, that 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 just doesn't work. Where does Mahler go every summer to write? He goes to the mountains. He goes into his yeah. little hut next to the lake and that's yeah. where he writes. So many writers yeah. and Yeah, and, and then and how much time is he actually writing and how much time is he out walking around and, and seeing and feeling. You know, I mean, one of the best things about being a band is from my hut to the top of Tunnel Mountain, I could run it and it was probably, I don't know, maybe 40 minutes to the to the summit from my hut. Man, what a great practice break. It clears the mind. It, it clears the mind. It gets your mind off of all those sort of loops you can get stuck in in a practice room. Yeah. And I think and it's also good physically because you're... physically. Again, yeah. music is kind of this repetitive motion yeah. thing where, which can cause injuries yep. in yep. and of itself. I think it's... Convincing people who've never experienced it that, you know, getting outside, first of all, can be easy. You don't have to go out and run 20 miles to feel like you're getting outside. Yeah. If you don't feel like you can leave your practicing behind, all these kids carry all their music around on an iPad now anyway. Yeah. So take your iPad out there, sit at that table outside yeah. under a tree 
and just see is that experience different yeah. from being down in the basement in that damn yes. stinky practice room yep you know and maybe that's the start of something i think the biggest mistake we make in training classical musicians is we teach them that variety is is somehow a weakness yeah that we, every, every minute you're not working that on we this you choose away. because yes. that, i mean that's one regret that i have as an undergrad i was told that i had to choose between flute and piano yeah and i i hope that they aren't doing that anymore but <laughs> they, they are but but it's yeah. but there's more interdisciplinary yeah support now yeah. there's a big push for that and just yeah. like the recital that that we just did yeah the of uh, that you just did <laughs> well, you didn't, the, your stuff was out there there was interdisciplinary with yeah. dance and poetry yeah. and photography yeah. there's so much that we can learn from doing other things you don't have to learn them to be a professional at it you mm -hmm. just learn it to have the experience and be able to take that experience and apply it. Maybe you get this idea for a brand new project that you want to do. More experiences aren't bad. And I feel like that's what we as classical musicians and maybe even outside of music in other disciplines, in other fields, we're taught to just be like laser focused on our goals in this field. And I feel mm -hmm. like we're missing out on so much by closing ourselves off to other experiences that can definitely help us. The more experiences you have, the more tools you have in your toolbox yeah. to express with. Yeah, and the more you have to express. Right, exactly. Yeah.